Thank you, Helle. Um, I'm just curious, what kind of support does the police in Nicaragua get, practically? They do get, I mean, they have officers, and it's something that uh, a national government is always willing to have. So in that sense, they're not so short in terms of manpower. They're very short in terms of, of skills uh, to actually deal with these issues. And they're very short of uh, resources to mobilize themselves. So, so what do you mean? You educate, I mean, aid could educate the police force and then what? Um, I think uh, it's very important that we recognize that to, to enforce the legislation which is in place, an environmental officer being trained as a forester or something else cannot do that job alone. If it has to go by the book and by the law, it needs these other uh, uh, legal institutions to work with them. And so, yes, they need to be accompanied very often if they want to confront a person who has just uh, cut down his forest. They need to be accompanied with a police officer. If that police officer is not oriented in that direction, there's no chance they will leave their office and, and do that kind of work. So that's a practical, practical way yeah. of, of helping out. Any yeah, questions? Here's one. I have another question. I mean, this thing of making governance more effective, uh, that kind of aid is hard to report back to, to the voters at home. Uh, do you have an idea how, how we could explain better what kind of um, effects this kind of aid has? So, so the politicians and the countries are more willing to give money for governance. I think we have been in the environmental field this is very dangerous to say. In the environmental field, we have been too focused on the resources and too little focused on the environmental rights of the people. I think if we want to make sure that there's sufficient and effective and just enforcement of environmental legislation, we have to be able to document that people have free access to state their claims and to have their claims processed the way they should be. And so that's another set of data that we need to have in order to demonstrate, because you're right, in order to demonstrate that what some people here in the room call very unsexy type of development cooperation is in fact very effective and very useful in this rights-based framework. Please. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to say, I mean, about your horizontal integration, and you were talking, and it's a very emotive story about the Ministry of Agriculture not wanting the Ministry of the Environment to encroach on its territory. But our experience is that it also goes, it's an issue of sequencing. At some point, it turns around. And so when the Ministry of Environment has been very successful in advocating for a policy change, a carbon tax, for example, they have to also be willing to let go and realize that they don't have the mandate to implement a carbon tax or a renewable energy strategy and so on. And I think the same goes for environmental research, that there has to be, has to be a, an acceptance that development researchers have to be able to take over and speak authoritatively about environmental issues. That, uh, I think we're in with our own research as well as policy, we're fighting this territorial um, problem. I think in, in development businesses and in, in love and emotions, possession is not the right motive. <laughs> that was beautifully yeah. said. Any more questions from the audience? There is the microphone here. Okay, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, in violation of regulations, there are two things that are necessary. The risk of punishment and the severity of punishment. So if the risk of detection or the probability of detection is low, uh, why not increase uh, the fine or the penalty for those who are caught violating the regulations and, there, and thereby reduce the frequency or the intensity of, uh, of uh, uh, violation? What do you think about that? Your I think, I hope that it's not an either or. I would hate to see that it is an either or because if the risk of being detected uh, is low, it also opens up the space for discretional governance. So I detect you because you're a person I don't like and I don't de detect your neighbor because we are allies somehow. I think that is a very, very dangerous uh, uh, box to open. So I would, I would love to see that the risk of detection is high whether your, your wrongdoing is small or big, and that the penalty corresponds to your wrongdoing and to your environmental costs 
that you have uh, incurred by that. Could you please give an example of when, when aid has uh, pressured governments to be more effective? Is there a good country, a country had, that has have had that effect, do you think? To be more effective... Or a better uh, governance when it comes to those issues. That is outside what I can say on the basis of my research. Uh. But, but uh, to take up these issues and to push, I think, uh, this quote that I just had, Nicaragua is a case uh, yeah. in point, even though I think with the revolution also came an environmental awakening in a sense. It's now dying again, so there's something going on that we shouldn't be too happy about. But I think in other countries, in Kenya is a case uh, we have in, um, in among our case studies where there has been a lot of uh, push from the donors that environmental issues should be taken more seriously, that there should be decentralization uh, of that governance, of that enforcement, and it's going in the right direction. We're not yet, that yet there but we're in the right direction. And I think one thing about looking at successes and failures and then trying to project is with all the effort going into formulating the environmental legislation, we should never get out of this room and think that we should just continue that since it was such a good success. We should say, okay, we have accomplished that and now we should move to the next step. And I hope that what we can push this room to go out and preach. Let's try it. Any more questions? Yes, here. Um, thank you. My name is Maria Nyholm. I work for the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. And having worked with the conventions for a number of years uh, in Sweden and um, also working in, uh, for the UN, but um, the conventions are quite patch-wise. Environmental issues are super broad. and. Um, even in, in Sweden, when we implement um, <coughs> the conventions and we're writing our national implementation plans, we kind of, you know, this is not a way that we can work because this is not a systematic way of working mm. with the environment. And I'm just thinking, how can we <coughs> improve the international framework so it becomes more systematic and, and we actually help countries in a systematic way, not only work on persistent organic pollutants, but how do we deal with hazardous substances? How do we work on waste, not only hazardous waste um, crossing borders? Uh, and also more focusing on um, the broader capacity um, needs that you actually talk about, the, the environmental governance capacity um, at the national level. And also, I think um, when we work with the conventions and we support um, through the aid, the implementation of the conventions, we're cre creating accountability chain from um, the implementation to the global community, and you're not first and foremost um, accountable to your citizens. And how can we? How can we make it simpler or easier to? Or better. Let's okay, and then we have another question, and then you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. My, uh, my name is Rasmus Larsen. I work with the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I was collaborating with Hill and Dees in this uh, work. That was just to, to offer a suggestion, build on, on Helle's point on uh, uh, horizontal integration or, or the concept of policy coherence, which I think the Swedish uh, Development Corporation is also centered around. Um, the need to think uh, not just integration in the host country or in Nicaragua, but actually in the donor <coughs> country, in a country like Sweden, when we have business activities, other relations with the country, often, especially when you raise, I think, the idea of the notion of accountability, often the real leverage for accountability sits where the actors are domiciled or located. And that means that, uh, especially uh, this, this time in our development uh, globally, a development corporation could be much more oriented towards uh, uh, work in other sectors, engagement with other sectors in its own society, and not just on the ground in Africa and Asia, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the next room, there's uh, now talk about the Millennium Development Goals, the post-2015 um, agenda, and as part of that, the, the efforts for developing also sustainable development goals. If, if you ask me what I think, because this is a matter of uh, how we think about it, I would think about it this way, that it's very good and it's very important that we have this overall framework for finding out when 
the different bits and pieces of world development are contradicting it, each other, and what should then be the dominant way or the most important criterion for, for deciding which way to go. I would be very um, uh, skeptical towards having conventions that were of this sort of environmental, uh, legally binding conventions that would be covering too many issues. I think uh, one, of, one of the beauties, even though it looks uh, cumbersome with all these conventions and all these reporting requirements and all these eight activities that follow, I think it's very important that we concentrate our effort on having conventions that are very clear, that are very simple, that have targets and that we can monitor. And it takes some resources, but I think we have also global facilities for funding these conventions that we should rely much more on rather than inventing our own ways of financing those through bilateral um, assistance. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you.